Okay. Everything's okay. okay. Turn your microphone Good. on. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Thank you all for being here. I want to greet you as the first day of Global Health Week begins. As you know, we're having it in collaboration with Diversity Week. There's so much overlap, right? So I hope you'll also support Diversity Week, Any uh, some of the activities going on there. But it's, it's really my uh, uh, pleasure to and, and privilege to introduce today's speakers. Um, I felt it was really appropriate and important to give voice to the those of those of us who are from the Ukraine and those people of Ukraine who are suffering so much in this this horror horror, the war there, uh, and and I hope that the speakers will illuminate this further for you and inspire us to to really um, stand by and support our colleagues and the people of Ukraine. So that we have three speakers today. The first I'll introduce each one, um, uh, and each one will be speaking about fifteen minutes. The first is Dr. Valeria Gritsenko. She is an associate professor in the School of Medicine Human Performance Department, the Division of Physical Therapy. The title of her talk is The Case for Rapid Modernization of Medical Research and Translation in Times of War. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am originally from Ukraine. I did my undergraduate education there. Um, in the uh, second largest city, Kharkiv, which is right on the border um, with uh, Russia and has suffered a lot in this uh, um, full-scale invasion. Um, I uh, did uh, my graduate education then in Canada, and I have been in Morgantown since 2011. Um, I have a lab in the biomedical sciences building. I do motor control research, and I will tell you a little bit about it today as well. So, but before I talk about research, I wanted to introduce a little bit Ukraine, um, how it was before the full scale invasion. Um, these are pictures from uh, Bucha and from Irpin before, sometimes days before the full scale invasion. Ukraine has been a budding democracy and developing um, uh, rapidly. Um, a lot of interest uh, um, was, of course, in uh, going toward the EU and, and fulfilling um, different, um, uh, making reforms, fulfilling different demands to become a modern um, democratic state. So, for example, they've uh, um, done a lot of healthcare reforms um, in a few years before uh, 2022. So they've committed to transforming this old Soviet-style healthcare system, focusing on patient needs. And the goal was to deliver more efficiently um, care and meet the goals of universal access. So it is a universal healthcare system uh, in the whole country. And they um, have spent a, did a lot of efforts to modernize it. Uh, for example, they did uh, um, formed an oversee uh, formed a committee to oversee financing of primary care. Uh, they did reform to improve uh, pay of health professionals, make a transparent web-based process to um, admit to medical school. That was uh, a, a, you know, efforts to reduce corruption. Um, e-health digital record systems were created. Um, and in 2017, there was a lot of uh, laws were passed to um, develop this new patient-oriented healthcare services. So, um, of course, in uh, February 2022, um, the full-scale invasion started. And, and these are some of the pictures we probably have seen. This is their pin. And, uh, um, um, and Bucha after the big invasion. And unfortunately, a lot of um, the uh, uh, cities um, and uh, countryside and a lot of the territory of Ukraine have suffered and continue to suffer from the, um, in, the, the war, uh, um, constant uh, bombings and um, um, all the warfare that's going on, of course. So the, currently, healthcare in Ukraine faces significant challenges. Um, so most of the information I get from World Health uh, Organization, uh, basically, specifically, they say that there's more than 1,100 attacks on Ukraine's healthcare system 
specifically since the invasion began um, in February 23, uh, more than one in 10 Ukrainian hospitals have been uh, directly uh, damaged by the war. Uh, my cousin um, works in uh, an infection, a hospital that specializes in infectious disease um, in Kharkiv. And he's um, just graduated from medical school a couple of years ago, and he was going through his residency in this hospital when uh, full-scale invasion started. Um, he's been there all the time. So through the first blitz-like bombings, he basically lived in the hospital because it had a basement, and he would work during the day, and then whenever there's an aerial raid, he would go and, uh, with the patients to the basement. Um, and then he had a bit of a time off, he went to the middle of Ukraine to his parents, and then he went back. And so uh, he's been continuously working nonstop. They had, of course, waves of COVID at first, and then the um, wounded and uh, uh, people suffering from the sort of, you know, soldiers' diseases, um, uh, uh, incredible conditions. Um, so despite these challenges, um, Ukraine has made a lot of the government still continues efforts to bolster public health and immunization efforts. Um, they had this big campaign to um, uh, vaccinate uh, people. Um, the World Health Organization has been providing services to deliver supplies, um, vital health care, and uh, uh, they also pledge to support reforms. So um, even though the war has significantly disrupted healthcare services, efforts are being still made nationally and internationally to address the challenges and, and continue the reforms and uh, develop Ukrainian healthcare system further. So how can we help? As a scientist, uh, I thought long and hard, what can I do uh, in my capacity to support um, healthcare, and of course, I think the most connection I have is with medical research. So um, healthcare relies on medical research to continuously improve and evolve. Um, we, uh, the medical research at the same time relies on insights from healthcare to identify areas that need further investigation. So evidence-based practice is a um, very important aspect to modern healthcare. Um, development of new treatments and therapies, improving patient outcomes, policy making, um, and of course, prevention and early detection of diseases. So my research is, is very much translational. So I do a lot of work, which is uh, taking basic um, neuroscience concepts and trying to apply them for new uh, ways to measure uh, motor deficits. So I have a picture of my very first participant, a volunteer in the studies, Jimmy. I think as soon as my lab started in 2011, he was the first patient in literally 2012. He came, um, he volunteered, he's had a stroke uh, a while back, but he's been very active and participating in research studies. And he believes that's a very big um, help to him. And he's hoping to also help future patients by participating in this uh, research. So um, we worked with uh, people like Jimmy here to develop ways to measure um, movement deficits after stroke, develop these computational models that tell us a lot about um, how the nervous system is changed um, after a stroke or other neurological damage and trauma. Um, this is the sort of research I do. Here's a, a, we use virtual reality a lot. Um, so this is uh, an example from one of the studies where a participant um, has this LED lights, uh, so we track movement using these lights, um, and then we visualize also the person's uh, movements in VR, and virtual reality is wonderful environment for us to have perfect control over the movement and, and instruction for the people what to do. Um, of course, we all have our ways to move, and so standardizing these uh, instructions is very important to minimize the kind of the, the, the intersubject variability, the, the quality of data that we get from these kinds of studies is very high. Plus, the, bonus, uh, the, the benefit of this is, of course, that this technology, um, when combined with models, can be used um, 
in the field. And this is where I think we can really uh, plug in with uh, our Ukrainian uh, counterparts. We don't need a very expensive devices to track movement. So here on the bottom is this uh, VR-based motion capture example but that can track uh, hands very uh, uh, accurately. Here's my most recent collaboration with a researcher, Kitaki Namda, here in uh, physical therapy. Um, she's, she's a pediatric physical therapist, so she studies development of babies. So we use videos um, to measure movement of babies and, and judge if they're developing um, uh, well or, or their de development of delays. So this kind of technology can be easily now transferred to Ukraine to help them uh, develop um, these assessment measures, develop new uh, interventions, and um, of course, um, um, develop their scientific enterprise as well to support the uh, healthcare needs. So this is one example of some of these uh, also international efforts to uh, um, support these kinds of collaborations. So this is a, a NSF um, grant that just recently came out, uh, specifically targeting uh, developing international multilateral partnerships uh, for resilient education and science systems in Ukraine um, that um, involves Ukraine, U.S. laboratories uh, and scientists, and also some East European countries like Poland, uh, Latvia, Estonia, in this uh, multinational effort. So this is where I think we can help the most. Um, I collaborate extensively here in WVU in U.S. I have collaborators in Ukraine as well that we've been working through the pandemic. We've been working with students there remotely, um, doing summer schools and um, masters supervising masters projects. So we have a lot of established collaborations that we are now hoping to grow and uh, uh, develop further. So with that, I will stop and take questions. <laughs> we can also switch with Sergey. So. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Dr. Sergey Yakovenko, and Sergey is an associate professor of Neural Engineering Laboratory, and also he's adjunct professor at the Statler School of Engineering at WVU. And the title of Sergei's talk is How to Support Wounded Warriors in Ukraine, the Role of Rehabilitation Technology and Research. Thanks very much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here and uh, appreciate your interest and support of this uh, a pretty emotional topic for, for, for us in particular. I just as well, I'm from the Eastern Ukraine, Kharkiv, and uh, it's been an announcement to be said that it's been deliberate for us by essentially fearing the population who do not want to live in this uh, uh, corrupt state. And there's a lot, a lot of uh, suffering that ideas brought ideas of this imperialism brought to Ukraine that was a wonderful place to go for a summer summer school to teach neuroscience, setting up the computational neuroscience schools that were exactly like you said. But it was the mentality of the local people who is no different from the mentality of people here. When when we talked about you know Ellen Musk rocket and talking about you know the future of cyborgs. And, and how we are going to fight that against the eye. This is one of the greatest conversations I had there. And uh, it was a pleasure to share. And then you know, immediately everything stopped. And instead of you know, thinking about that, we're, we're forced to uh, face a lot of uh, suffering, a lot of people losing limbs, uh, getting injured in different ways. This is the Close to the downtown of my of my hometown, and uh, sorry, I get get emotional because um, it's a story of my my family here that decided to leave uh, their their apartments in this area 
to go outside because and I was saying, you know, I got the more side of you guys should kind of keep yourself to closer to downtown because you know, no civilization will fall in secret. Uh, even on the outskirts, you're exposing yourself to, to all this possibility of military aggression because the, of the movement of military assets. So it then turns out that the safest place was outside of this. The, uh, my, my father is a civil engineer. He built his house out of Soviet blocks of uh, bricks and, and armor and, uh, because there was stuff available. And all the community of people kind of fled to his, his house uh, in, the, in, the, in the garage. Uh, we're talking about 20 people just in the middle of, of the winter, uh, entertaining kids and, you know, trying to um, not get into the world. So, uh, it's will decide which we is Right. Encourage them and uh, stay positive, but um, but horror was all around them. So right away, I want to say, you know, how can we help? Uh, I and we'll go a little bit more about uh, abilities that we have in the technical medicine and training, and uh, I, I really. Appreciate all the effort you guys did. Some people for this this one here to react quickly and 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 rush with your your systems. Uh, I will I will echo Valeria's point about research outreach and the possibility of collaborations in the and that that is the main idea. Idea that we can uh, see the silver lining in all of this and find something that is going to be constructive. Ukraine is is known as a hub of technology. So you might recognize some of these icons and because you run Grammarly for your coursework. Well, maybe it's an alternative to you have been productive. Mark uh, 4 is my Mac, Mac stage. Uh, I, I use uh, some of the people in AI to help me figure out how to, to go about startup. And and be the these are many more technologies is what Ukrainians are really good at. There is an opportunity there. Our own research, that I mentioned, is in here in education. And, and really, for more sensitive on the control, we're interested in how the brain works, how our brain controls our work. We are not really pathetic people, but this, this danger and the realization that so many young people now will have to be with their species, with implants changed my mind about where to find myself. And and now we are working uh with Oscar. We we boost up our straight program from DARPA understanding how how different how we just work with those actual devices and investigating how the education works, how do you apply that in a clinical and, and difficult situation. So lots of interesting questions again related to brain machine interfaces to recovery from injury. And Ukraine is making strides in, in creating facilities that are not very different from our own, especially when you move from the Western side. In the West, you have modern hospital, modern technologies. Uh, the, the use of hospital in particular was unbroken has about 120 beds with about 100 of them is dedicated to the human dog, which is something we don't have. They might lack some of the technology, but they have facilities, they have a lot of money in the people, and of course, a lot of money. What's, um, yeah, what, what they ask really is, is just saying, you know, guys, we, we are interested in research. Of course, we are overloaded. Of course, we have all, all the necessity to deliver care as soon as possible, but at the same time, they also have ability to track people as they recover from green loss. To think about technologies that might be a little bit further in the future, like wholesale integration. We have just done the first integration procedure here, and that will be a year ago. 
uh, we have four patients in double view. The first four patients in Western Virginia, well, we really had six patients, the first six patients in Jupiter, and they were very successful at pushing this, this technology as, as the potential to solve one of the worst things about having a prosthesis, connecting it to your bones and, and able to have technology in that more heavier prosthetic. So they have a places, you know, if you walk in r and you might see a, a space that, that looks very similar to this. They have uh, motion capture, they have people who understand technology, they have ability to report data, uh, they, they are savvy about uh, statistical analysis of big data. Uh, they, they're not very good at grant writing. And that's kind of one of the things that we could help potentially. They, they're definitely trying to reach out to, to us for guidance in clinical and medical procedures and, and invites uh, many international surgeons to come to me and, and perform surgeries, teach them uh, how to use modern equipment. And that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy for Lviv. Lviv is a wonderful town. Uh, this is, by the way, one of the also integrated subjects here. You see that this, uh, it's a trans, uh, it's above the knee, but static to be very, um, and they how to live in England there. Uh, they have rehabilitation facilities, again, to enable long-term analysis of what happens when you, you go through something like this. Again, so I said, I'm really happy for Lviv, but I'm from Kharkiv. That's on the other side. It's, it's 40 kilometers from Russia. It's so still shelling, shelling the city. The, uh, this is here, so halfway. Halfway and, and Ramadana Peace Trip. I guess I don't have the, the, the uh, I'm just here the, the top of it. But this is an institute uh, we done down here uh, from my collaboration with this fault, they were attempting to do surgeries, but one day that would be a rocket, probably 200 meters on one side of the building, on another day, 200 meters on the other side. And they would say, well, mathematically speaking, maybe tomorrow it will be, you know, our, our new site, our city. But they can still work in uh, all this time, uh, open, you know, burning really uh, with all, you know, even all the energy they have. Uh, they, they had to learn a lot because they, they kind of went from hard nearest in their surgical cases to pretty much everything to do with trauma because they have any complex trauma. Uh, what they they have is the amazing base of technology. And it's unusual to get from other dogs in places because you have a equivalent of you know uh, stimulators that we use here. They are one of them. They yes, to be in further ahead with some of the procedures that they do. For example, this this simulator is completely wireless, has multiple sites, and you can what they do, they place these, these systems right over the the, the trans, uh, transfer nerve and promote treatment of pain, but simulation because you just have your app on the phone and you can control the amount of simulation you deliver. Or, you know, there's a deal potentially there's a moment of the direction. Where are we going now? And we don't have a people in the side of this really here. Um, so, yeah, there could be unique opportunities working with the Ukrainians. And uh, I highly encourage, you know, when you have these ideas to reach out to us and to them directly to enable this. And again, our technology is, it is definitely more advanced. We have more finances here. One idea is for, for your technical interest to, to talk to us with your questions and ideas, and we could translate these technical applications in Ukraine. Again, remember that we are not the initiative here, yeah? we're just uh, researchers about nerds who seem to know out and we like to play with equipment, but we need, we need your technical expertise to, to kind of connect to us so we can connect to deliver. So we have uh, we have great devices to report neuroactivity. We have great models to 